doctors just as long as I'm scared they know I'm a white person. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to seminar this week. Hope everybody's doing good. Excited for spring break. Um, this week, we are going to talk about um, mining and scrap plastic recycling. Um, Rob Reeves is going to be our presenter. Um, we just wanted to make a big thank you to everyone who was able to um, post on social media and support Amid um, with the funding. We really appreciate all the support. I did want to say thank you very much that um, this time you guys post and send it out to hit a lot of people. Um, we were able to raise more than expected for a mid um, to cover the cost of dental surgeries that he's going to have to have. He's going to have multiple. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you guys very much for that. All right. So next week is going to be spring break. Um, the week after that, we're going to have a bigger meeting. We're inviting the National Mining Hall of Fame to come down. And we have a, a special presenter. Stephen Horger coming in, he's gonna talk about um, mine planning and the importance um, to avoid replanning of operations. So it'll be a really good opportunity to come network with a lot more uh, people, um, including alumni and people involved in the National Mining Hall of Fame. So I do encourage everyone to participate and come next week for that. Um, with that, Rob, I'm gonna hand it over to you and we'll get started. Thank you guys. Thank you, Sarah. You know, many of you, um, son was one of my former students in money plan, and I'm old enough probably to be some people's grandfather on the area. Good to see the metallurgy here. Who's the metallurgy people? Mineral processing. Okay, and who is mining? Everybody else? Any, any other stragglers that are not mining or metallurgy? And we got some geology stuff. And if you're a geologist, you'll appreciate this too, because I hit on metallurgy, mining, and mineralogy. I'm a mining engineer. At least that's what the degree says. But I've been working in uh, basically material handling and processing with phase and research and mines. This uh, all will be my 50th reunion. So if I look old, it's because I am. <laughs> I'm not as old as Eric, though, so I'm pretty good. <laughs> I'm a little bit older than Steve back here. Thank you for coming, Steve. I appreciate it. This is not my cup of tea. I might top my plant with nothing but chalkboards. Remember that? Sandra, I think you saw that. I just chew PowerPoint because uh, it's the way I was taught anyway. So, we got to look over my shoulder here a little bit. Thank you for being patient. A little bit of background on why we're talking about scrap plastic and mining. I worked for 30 years at Hazen Research. Does anybody here besides Eric know about Hazen Research? You know, we do all sorts of bizarre things. Basically, it's a 10 acre science fair project where there are no rules other than just coming to work and going home <laughs> and having a lot of fun while you're doing bizarre things. And one of the bizarre things I got involved in with one of my clients starting about five years ago was working with scrap plastic. And I found it would be very similar and touched on my mining experience and my mineral processing experience. In fact, I had a real ball with it. And the client last April said, we no longer need your consulting services because we have other problems involved with chemistry and you can't help us with that. However, once we solve that problem, perhaps we'll bring you back in. But I found it to be a real challenge, mainly because it was learning. And with this business, my goal of the day is to excite you about things that you can apply your expertise as mines graduates, future mines graduates, you'll be able to solve problems unrelated to what you thought you learned in school because you know basics. Yeah, and you'll see that in just a minute. Let's see here. 
All right. Let's talk about what we're going to learn here in the next 30 minutes. We're going to consider the various types of plastic, and this is background to help you understand the complexities of this business. No different than dealing with different minerals and trying to figure out ways not only to mine them, but to extract the mineral, metal values from those minerals. We're going to talk about the birth, the life, the death, and the afterlife. I don't like calling it recycling. I think that we all hope that there's a good afterlife and plastic thinks the same thing. We're going to find out that recovering metal values from ores is not a lot different than recovering plastic, which is a valuable target for garbage. And we're going to be explicitly looking at residential curbside picked up garbage as the source of our plastic. In other words, we're talking about consumer plastic, which is devoid of some of the thermal set plastics that you find in manufacturing, for example, or some of the PVC that you'd find in an industrial setting. And hopefully we can look how we're going to apply our skills in a meaningful way to really a big problem. Plastic is a vexing problem, not because of tonnage, but because of volumetric considerations. Litter is unsightly. Everybody says we should get rid of plastic or we should get we should have more recycling. It's up to engineers to figure out how to do that. And if you're a chemical engineer, you know how to make plastic, but you may not know Jack. That's about how to recycle. It's going to come down to people who are material handling, processing, mining engineers to really make a breakthrough appointment into this field. Let's look at the various types of plastic. Now, these happen to be, fortunately, I discovered a image off the internet that was color coded for me. We've all seen these recycling symbols. Sometimes there's abbreviation like the number one. You might see PET or PETE, that is an acronym for the type of plastic it is. Who can say this word without difficulty? Theraphthalate. Nobody ever calls it that. They call it PET, and we know that because it's the most voluminous, not the heaviest, but the most voluminous plastic. And you see it in all the drink bottles. In fact, I see one sitting right on top of her desk. Can I have that, please? Okay, we have a PET bottle. If you look somewhere on it, they're going to have the recycling symbol on there. That's important, maybe not to the customer, but when this bottle arrives at a recycling station, we can quickly identify this as PET, which is valuable. We don't like paper labels. So somehow we're going to have to figure out how to take that paper label off in any groove that might be surrounding it. And the cap is not PET. Anybody give a guess of what the cap's made from? Let me see. It's made from number two plastic, which is high density polyester. So I have a little retained strip. I have a cap which is a plastic that's completely different than PET. Now I have that PET, HC, and that's number two. And if it's little green, that means that most recycling. <laughs> that is green is easy to re um, recycle. PP polypropylene is in more rigid cups like yogurt cups, dishes, and other plastics. Those are the three main types of plastic like Denver can recycle. There's other plastics, however. LDPE was just outlawed in terms of their bags, not outlawed, but you have to pay 10 cents a bag. And the value of the plastic is about a tenth of a penny. So it's 101 charge of what it's worth versus what um, it costs. And also PS, which is polystyrene. Polystyrene, who has built Revell models? Smith the Blue Water building. Very dear old enough to remember Revell models. Yeah. Remember putting those together and they're made from styrene. 
And when you burn styrene, it's wonderful. Black smoke pours off into your airplane, crashes. But now we see it as foam plastic. Foam plastic, foam, um, foam cups, for example, are difficult to recycle because of such low bulk density, five pounds per cubic foot. Now, the rock and the ore that you're dealing with is like 110 pounds, 120 pounds per cubic foot. So we have a volumetric problem otherwise. Let's finish this up. LDPE is low density polyethylene, they get garbage sacks, low value um, plastic containers. Polyvinyl chloride is ambiguous in the construction industry, pipe, uh, various types of sheeting, so forth, all has PVC. And as far as residential garbage concerned, PVC is a contaminant. PVC contains chlorine. Who wants to guess on a weight percent basis how much chlorine is in PVC? 30%. It's about 53%. Mm -hmm. So when you pick up a piece of PVC pipe, just think of it, I'm looking at half that weight is chlorine. Now, chlorine happens to cause lots of problems in recycling for reasons that we won't get into today. Others, there are every other type of things, thousands of different resins that are made, thermal sets and thermal forms, things like polycarbonate, acrylic. You know all those sneezing shields that we had for COVID? You know, the ones that protected us mightily from catching COVID because we're looking through a sheet of plastic? That's acrylic. That cannot be recycled by current technology. Nobody wants it. All that stuff is going to be landfilled or burned. Polycarbonate is worth a lot more, but it's still not recycled either. Recycled plastics are almost without exception, nothing but carbon hydrogen, usually on a one-to-one -one molecular ratio. So really recycling in its very core is nothing more than reclaiming hydrogen and carbon. This is just to show briefly um, a series of researches um, published in the Journal of Physics Conference here recently that 40% of the packaging materials, or I should say 40% of the plastic that's going to go into the package, those are those nasty things you can't get open when you buy batteries from Costco and you end up cutting yourself either with a knife or with that thick plastic. That plastic is usually polypropylene. And then in the packaging, LDPE, PP, and you can see that on the right side, the composition or use of those plastics. Notice how PVC is almost negligible. It used to be widely used for saran wrap, but saran wrap contains chlorine, which really upsets this recycling business. So chlorinated shrink wrap now is usually only used in industries where they're wrapping pallets, for example, and they really need high strength shrink wrap. Okay, now we're getting into the favorite subject, life and death of plastic and what happens, hopefully in its afterlife. This is the life. Almost all plastic comes from crude oil. Yes, we do have some bio products coming from corn, but that's insignificant in this presentation. So that goes to a petrochemical plant, probably somewhere in Louisiana or someplace that we don't know about, the Gulf of Texas. It makes a monomer. That goes to polymerization. And here's where we add additives such as dyes for coloring the plastic, or we add a filler, limestone, talc, a myriad of other things to give plastic its mechanical properties. If you've noticed, who's noticed now it's hard, not because of age, but because the strength of plastic, even opening like a little pouch of, I don't know, Intermint when you go to Rip City. Has ever tried to open those and you can't? But we used to be able to do that. The reason why is during that polymerization process, they cross link the molecules more so than they have in the past. So these plastics really get tough. The other thing is they put things like aluminum foil and other things to act as a barrier from oxygen. 
Some plastics are permeable, some require some type of coatings to suit the application. All right, so that the polymers then are usually in the form of pellets that go to the product molding, either injection molding or blow molding or other types. And guess what? All that stuff shows up when you went to Costco, probably 50 weight percent of all the packaging is plastic. So you throw it away. Hopefully a truck comes along that's usually painted green that says, yes, we recycle. The answer is they don't. We're lucky if 80% of the plastic is only going to recycle it's at 90 or 95%. Just because you put things in a recycle bin doesn't really mean it gets recycled in a meaningful way. There's lots of articles about that. But consider the majority of all your trash goes right to landfill. Any idea why that's the case, even though we know that we shouldn't be doing that? Just sorting the actual material so it's able to be recycled and actually put into the recycling process. Okay. It's probably economic or it's difficult to recycle. Packaging has got a lot more complex. When you buy a toothpaste tube, that's not just the thing in plastic. That's about as five or six or maybe even seven layers of different types of plastic. One that you can print, make it look nice. Others, an oxygen barrier, perhaps aluminum or mylar. You want something that's flexible, so they use LDPE, but you've got to have an HDPE cap. And then we got to have some other metal that may be associated with that so it can be seen by an X-ray device during its manufacturing process. Plastic packaging's really got complicated. So the recyclers are losing money. It costs them a dollar to pick something up and they can sell it for 10 cents. So guess what? Landfilling, at least in Colorado with lots of land is cheap. Not the case back east. So what do we do? Back east, a company called Covanta, that's their old name, they burn all the trash. In fact, they make a significant amount of electricity using fossil fired equipment for burning trash leaving nothing but a small insignificant amount of ash residue. That's his own recycling issue, which we won't discuss today. So then it comes down to a recycler. Mechanical recycling goes this way, and that's where we take this clean, sorted plastic back to the molders, and they mix it with the virgin pellets, and they make another bottle. How many times can you recycle plastic that way? Once. Go ahead. Very, very long. He's seen my presentation already. Thank you for being a fan of my audience. <laughs> you know what? It's like growing old. You can look good after one Botox, Botox shot, but after three, that's it. You're old. You're no longer hired, right? Same with uh, polymers. They long chains get flipped up and destroyed because of heat or chemical action or for other reasons. Injection molding actually tears the polymers apart as well. It can. So what they really is not really recycling. That's not what the industry calls it. They call it downcycling. So what ended up is your bottle that um, she, we can actually play catch with. After it makes a bottle that's in contact with food, cannot be used for that, probably not extraordinary care once again. So guess where it ends up when you downcycle pet bottles? Everybody here knows because I have polyester probably in the shirt. So polyester clothing is the biggest consumer of pet bottles. That's downcycling. Polyethylene ends up as flower pots or worse yet, Trex flooring. So really what happens, you start with something that's worth a dollar a pound, it ends up worth even five cents a pound, relatively speaking. Every time it gets recycled, it gets where they can't use it anymore. In the sorting process, they can see things that are old and things that are new, relatively speaking. So the company I work for, I should say my client, decided to go this way, it's called chemical recycling. That's where we depolymerize the plastic back into monomers. So really it's nothing but replacing crude oil. This loop can be used unlimited number of times 
this loop might be used once, twice, no more than three or four times. Any questions about that so far? Okay. Let's get into things for the metallurgists. I see uh, Eric kind of like, are you paying attention, Eric, or are you just relaxed? I'm ready to hear about liberate and separate. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. That's exactly what happens here. So we have curbside pickup. We go through primary sorting, usually with screens, ballistic separation. <clears throat> what we want to see coming out the end is only bulkies or films. Bulkies are everything but films. So if you have a yogurt cup, that's a bulky. If you have that bag that they've outlawed at King Supers, that's film. Film stuff is really difficult to handle and recycle for a lot of reasons. It's not nearly as easy or as cost. It's much more costly to recycle film than it is bulkies. So the bulkies come down. And we go through sortation. And if um, YouTube works well here, I'll show you that. It's really, to me, it's intriguing because lots of things are moving. But we get waste. The things that are the plastic and the color and the shape that I want get granulated. This is Eric's uh, liberation. liberation. All the food waste that's within plastic. You know, plastic recyclers are like large, huge restaurants. All they're doing is creating food waste, among other things. That gets removed through what they call washing. There's various ways of doing this. So we make uh, sewage. And out comes, hopefully, chips of plastic that are clean, the right color, the right resin type. And that goes back to mechanical recycling. Let's look at the similarities here. This is between the mining guys, the metallurgists here, and the geologists here. I'll let you read this. This is something that the industries are similar because it takes guts, experience, because we deal with worthless rock and somehow we extract that parts per million of gold out of it and hopefully make a profit. Plastic skies are just the same. They're getting all this garbage, which is nothing more than humanity. You will find everything ever created, and some things that are having to created in scrap plastic that's picked up at curbside. I mean, when you see what's in that material, you're just amazed. Everything that's ever touched humanity ends up there, including hypodermic needles, medicines. Um, one of our things we picked up, depending on where you pick it up, you go through like a Haitian or some other society place or a, a ghetto, you'll find voodoo masks, trinkets, clothing, a lot of coins, everything in the world comes to that, just like being surprised at a mineral place. Piles of garbage are remarkably the same. You don't know if it's economic until you've already spent a million dollars and spent 99.9% .9 of the money. And Garbage only reveals its secrets after you've had a long and expensive affair with it. Mm -hmm. like horror. What's the differences between what challenges us in the mineral industry and plastic? It's really low bulk density. In other words, what we find out is a large sorting facility can handle five tons per hour. But the volume of what's going through that plant is pretty substantial. Like some plants handle about 2,000 truckloads of garbage a day. A ton of recycled milk bottles is worth more than about any horror that you'll find. 2,500 bucks for a ton of milk bottles. What I won't tell you is how many cubic feet are in that ton of milk bottles. Who knows what the weight of the milk bottle is? Or let's just say a drink bottle. That pet drink bottle, how much do you think it weighs? A pound? Tenth of a pound, nine grams is the average weight. And look at the volume for nine grams. In handling processing of scrap plastic reminds me of looking at the Deco handbook of 1951. Stuff is small, 36 inch conveyor is running at maybe 50 feet per minute. It's a large conveyor for scrap plastic. 
we're not talking 72 inch or three meter belts running at 20 meters per second or some other copy speed. And here's the biggest difference. Reserves of plastic are ever increasing. We will never have a depletion allowance for plastic. It's a negative depletion allowance to use that because we'll never, we're never out of it. Mm -hmm. They're making about 10 times as much as we recycle currently. Okay. Why are miners even, this is inspiration talk now, why would you be interested in scrap? Because only people with tough, we're experienced with tough jobs, failures, naysayers, people that said we can't get things done. The scrap guys haven't been in the industry long enough to know what it's like to have a pearl going up over some 12,000 foot pass, dragging a couple pounds of steel shot with it. We have a broad knowledge about things. We've said that mining is an inch deep and a mile wide. You need that kind of mentality to scrap because you'll never know exactly what you're going to get. And we see value in everything, especially scrap might be the next common stuff. Let's consider the similarities between iron ore and plastic, or not iron ore, because it's ore in general. Deposits are buried in the earth for plastic, excuse me, for ores. They're created by nature. Some would say created by God. They're usually deep. This is what you hire guys like Steve Enders for, because he can figure out exactly what that displacement is by one drill hole in a lot of density. However, in scrap, we have landfills. That's our ore body for scrap plastic. In mining, we require, we require 400 ton haul trucks. In scrap, we want 400 pound haul parts. Okay, the majority of the world is in that last picture in terms of plastic waste. Okay. Okay, and when we're dealing with ore, we put that in stockpiles. In scrap plastic, we put them in fly hotels. Rodent control, pest control is a big issue about storing scrap plastic. They come in bales. Those bales usually weigh somewhere between 1,000 to 2,000 pounds each. They're three feet by four foot by five foot. And they're banded. So these things are usually set out in the sun for as much as 60 to 90 days before you see them, the scrap recycler. So all that yogurt that you put in there and found out was a wonderful thing for storing harvesting larvae. So this is really a smelling, nasty operation. Get used to it, but it's what we have to deal with. Okay, we look to explore for our scrappers, make deals in back rooms. In other words, is one of the most opaque industries we've ever dealt with. There's an organization like we have SME and mining. And scrap plastic and scrap in general has an organization called ISRI, I S R I. They state at any of the meetings that we will not make public any of our financials, any of the deals that you do, and literally the deals for I will give you X for Y all occur in the back room. It's they don't publish the truth. It's full of nothing but good old boy networks where you can very difficult to get accurate information into the future. You can always look up what somebody reported they paid, but that doesn't include all the terms. It's almost like dealing with a smelter schedule. Thank you, Steve, for having <clears throat> what Martin Cohen has uh, described that with uh, very nicely. Why is it like that? Is it just I call it the maturity of the industry. Yeah, it's the way that it always was. And the client that I had, they had a person really connected with finding out the value of the source of plastic. They would never, ever share that information with processing engineers. Well, 
What kind of stuff am I going to get? Don't worry about it. They call it, they don't even have a classified, they call it 37. The plastic bottle seal will be 90% three through seven on the resin code and about 10 or 15% type one and type two plastic. They don't even, it's like, what kind of word do you have? It's a form group. Don't ask any more questions. Sit down and shut up. So, because of that, the industry hasn't progressed very far in terms of its transparency, in terms of how things are really done efficiently. That's one of the barriers to effective recycling. Okay, we drill an assay, right? What do you think scrappers do? They count bottles. So, they take a sample of garbage. And you hire people and they just go through and they pick out plastic. And these guys get to be pretty good at identifying resin codes. There's actually handheld devices, remember handheld XRFs? They have handheld devices that can tell you the resin code. But in many cases, these guys are really good. They separate the film, the bulkies, resin type by color, and they put them off to the side. And that's how you get assays or garbage. Processing is very similar to recycling, except for the scale of operations. Here's a picture of a 200,000 ton a day mill. Eric, are you familiar, or Ohan, are you, are you very familiar with this operation? Not the corporate or, Panama, but some yeah, other places. It's 240,000 tons a day. Enormous. They only have mm -hmm. one, they must have two mills. They might. Okay, that's only half. half. That's only 100,000 tons a day. Well, here's a very large size recycling plant that operates at 50 tons per day. And their operating hours are typically 5,000 hours a year. They don't have the 91, 92, 93, 95 percent availability that we expect at money. No. The garbage haulers that bring stuff in here, they don't operate 24-7 like miners do. They can only operate on roads when they have social license to have these trucks, these garbage trucks. So it's not the same. We reclaim scrappers landfill. So when you talk about residential curbside pickup, 95% of it's going to come back to the landfill. That's all the things like bicycle tires, mattresses, um, engine blocks, paper. Everything else except for the plastic goes back to the landfill, but it should be maybe gone through incineration where you take power. But here in the West, land is cheap, so landfilling is usually a preferred method. Oh, by the way, that's not a bird sanctuary. You can identify the type of birds for some reason they're attracted to landfills. Okay, now here's a video that does not run in PowerPoint, so I'm going to have a separate issue. I want to show you how they actually can identify plastic by color, shape, and resin type using optical sorting. It's really fascinating to see this as much as I, I mean, this is its own industry. It's this in things by Tomer, which is also in the mining industry. And the metallurgists here probably know about more sorting using x-rays or perhaps color or shape. It's really a big deal. So let's review. We need seasoned and practical folks like mining and metallurgists and geologists to be concerned about how you know, it somehow everything you've learned about that, the basics of internal handling, solving problems, knowing the environmental consequences, how to clean up water, how to handle things, and how to clean the problem. The scrap industry is like where we were in the 50s. So what we learn here can be immediately applied to that industry to good effect. And the boys done that. So I'm gonna see if I can play that from that sorting video. Who has seen optical sorting? Have you guys ever, some of the metalworks have seen, seen that? It's really an amazing thing. We, we have optical sorters here, Eric. No, we'd like to get a, well, I've seen them a lot of places, but we would like to, in this next round of DOE work, is to try to figure out 
how to actually get a sorter here and then do um, uh, development work on it uh, on an ore body. So, you know what? We're I close. Know, I don't know where that video went. Go to YouTube, type in Tomer plastic sorting. There's probably not only just from Tomer, but a link. Um, and numerous others. Lens. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Numerous others make all the sorting. They look at, I don't know, millions of individual particles per hour on really the sorters. And they do it with great accuracy and really a lot of technology. The big difference, though, is they have to see every individual piece. In mining, like flotation, do we look at every grain of mineral and decide whether it's going to be concentrated or tails? No, we look at it in bulk. There are methods that were proposed at Hazen Research. We no longer use optical sorting, we use density separation. In other words, plastic can be separated by, by specific gravity very nicely in heavy medium. But the scrap industry has not adopted that to any large degree because they just don't know about it yet. Any questions for me? And I certainly appreciate talking with you. Yes, Steve. So, are, are, Sarah, are you or somebody logged in that we can just pull up the website and look? Let me see if I can do it. Please. Uh, we, got, we got a few minutes. So, that's where you would look. I'm going to go to this other computer and do it. Yep. And Sarah? Or yeah. who knows how to do the other computer, please? Uh, with, you just got a log in. Yeah, I'll do it from here, dear. Can you hit stop sharing on your computer? Sure. Actually, I need him to find it. So depending on moisture content, it's around. Yeah, I'll be going to do it in XR. Well, not XR. Yeah, XR. Keys. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
okay, all right, how much does ball milks cost or energy consumption of ball milks? Kilowatt hours per ton. 20. Yeah, for a hard order, right? Yeah. Who wants to guess how many kilowatt hours it takes to consolidate plastic? Like making pellets out of it. Kilowatt hours per ton of plastic pellets. Okay, 20 for a hard ore. Who wants to give the guess? It's just simple plastic, just melts. 100 kilowatt hours per ton. So if you're like in Germany where you're paying 35 cents per kilowatt hour, this electric charge is just pelletizing material. It is extreme. Isn't there also a problem with the different resins because of the coefficient of expansion? So if you try to make something out of, unless it's pure material, if you, know, if you make a, a, a bus bench um, after one year, uh, it'll just be powder laying on the ground unless you have all of it the same resin. Yeah, last the sorting has got to be 99.9% a certain type of resin, but resins get filled, okay? Very seldom, except for things like milk jugs or these pet bottles, you find just the plastic resin itself. It includes all sorts of other things to stabilize and give it volumetric bulk. Okay, look at this. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I want to see that. We start that again. Good job. I'll explain what this is. Yes, okay, this is the sorting machine. So what what what's the effect that they use to split the stream? Is it air blast? What is it for air? And air is with some of the there is a long there. Yeah, belts fast. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see if I can explain what you just saw. Let's see how you can you turn the volume off on that one? Hearing myself once is enough. Once to hear me twice. Yeah. Me. <clears throat> All right. What you saw there is just characteristic is sorting using near infrared light. That means light that's just a little bit longer wavelength than what you see in the red spectrum. As it turns out, plastics particularly polystyrene, polypropylene, polyethylene, and others, reflect light spectrum in very unique ways. So that mirror that spins is broadcasting a beam of near-infrared light across the belt, and then a sensor is picking up the reflection from that piece, and then it will tell the air ejection Manifold, which is a series of little holes. Okay, in 300 milliseconds, I want you to blast air for X milliseconds. So that air will launch that bottle, what they call ejects or throws, over a fence. If it's something that's called positive sorting, if it's negative sorting, 
you don't turn on the air, you let what they call drops, just the ballistically path that will go down right off the head fully on that conveyor. So these sorters, they can use multiple sensors. We can sort on color, resin type, and shape. And I about only 20 have others. large bottles. And about 20 other sensors. Right, there's x-ray and others in the mining world who look at minerals, we use x-rays. Radiometric, Magnetic, conductivity. Right? Ouija boards, spirits. <laughs> we need yes. more, we need more. Yes. <laughs> All right, but you can see the computers required to time air blasts, and those have to have a million actuations an hour. So the solenoid valves are very robust. Yeah. I'm curious. And that uh, diagram that they showed there, um, they showed that there was the air ejection blast to separate the bottles, but like 90% of the bottles were being blasted by that air. Um, is that normal how they would set it up? Because it seems like it'd be easier just to let 90% of them just fall down and then for the 10%, shoot those ones over. Well, that is either positive or negative story. Yeah. Depends on if you're talking about rubber cleaner or scavenger operations. In the scrap business, they don't use that word, but that's exactly what it is. So in the first go, we may want to say, I want to see anything that's clear. I don't care the resin type. And then those things tend to be light. So then they'll be misplaced if they're drops because there's their, they have their own aerodynamic drag coefficients yeah. coming across. And some of these, they actually use air on top of that to hold the plastic down so that it can be accelerated properly to maybe 400 feet a minute. Yeah, Lee. So what's the effectiveness of this machine given that we are going to sort something with irregular shapes and probably one overlapping others? What's the effectiveness? They do image recognition. They're really good at that now. They have multiple cameras and get stereo views. That I only want to see small bobs that are yellow and are made from polystyrene, like a medicine bottle. I only want medicine bottles. So they're able to do some really great sorting and high speed computers. And there's some pretty good reliability. They have a probable error or a, um, the ability to misplace your sort decision. They're probably pretty good at 90% of the correct sort if they're maintained properly. What really happens, all the food waste that's associated with this makes this thing look like a dirty thing that you wouldn't want to even get near after a while. So they have to be maintained. Yeah, they're right. In the in the mining industry, we actually can now sort in free fall. So we have material that's free falling out of the feeder. We look at it, and a meter later, the it ejects it either out of that free fall or allows it to pass through there. Um, but the expense is really one of the big operating expenses in the mining industry is clean air. Mm -hmm. Having clean air in a plant to be able to effectively do those separations. Yeah, and so there are some problem. that have flippers. Uh, the flippers are almost never used in plastic. They have been in the past. But the mechanical action is every single piece. You're talking about a million pieces an hour or more. Think of all the actuations that have to have. That plastic bag is worth something. They have these in separate these garbage sacks or bags. She used to get them to keep super free. So they can actually separate bags by color or size and other things. One thing they can't do, which is the downfall of the cost of recycling, they cannot see black. Okay? Anything is dyed black because using carbon black as the dye, it just completely foils the reflectance signature given from near infrared light. Okay. So black plastic now is about 30% of the waste plastic in the street on residential garbage. 
So as a result of that, 30% of your infeed to your plant may be the right polymer type. It would be perfect, except it's black. We can't optically sort it. So at Hazen Research, we developed ways to separate that using specific gravity. The specific gravity doesn't care about color. The reason why we have black plastic, why? Because there's some ideas of why we have so much black plastic now. Yes. Well, I imagine them like in microwavable meals, maybe it has a higher heat resistivity. Well, that's interesting. I haven't considered that. Why else? So, do they just like. They need less processing. If I'm sorry? They may need less processing when they are prepared. Now, if it's coming from recycled plastic, guess what? We got green, blue, red, clear, all kind of mixed together. So the plastic looks brown when it's melted. Yeah, throw carbon black with it and make it black and be done with it. So most black containers are perfection known as clamshells in the industry. You know, you get your donuts, you get your whatever food types that you can open up. Those are usually black plastic, your salads. Almost always that's recycled plastic because it doesn't require a lot of strength. It's only going to be used. It's going to go to the landfill. The minute you're done with it, it's after life. It's certain death in the landfill because it cannot sort it using optical sorting. Gravimetric sorting hopefully will become the mainstay someday. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, yeah Rob. I, I know you know certain plastics and certain thicknesses also come into play about recycling. I know a, a company in Auburn, Washington that recycles tanks, mm -hmm. plastic tanks, water tanks, mm -hmm. and, they, and they're cutting them with water jets in order to get them small enough pieces they could actually mm -hmm. feed it. That's got to be incredibly expensive. And I know the biggest new market for them is these plastic kayaks. And so they, they chop these things up into little pieces. Yeah. And, and but, those little meniscus pieces are going to be porous. It's not in contact with food. No, no. no it's but that's got to be really expensive. I mean, it's got to be astronomically expensive. So, what happens if you put that clay oil into the food column to grow? What does that do? It's a whole thing about the water. So then why recycle it? Mm -hmm. Well, we look at our soup entries that don't replace looks like hell. We don't feel good about ourselves. China used to take all the scrap from the garbage from the United States, much of it. They, they don't anymore. Why? Why does it's called Operation Sword? Who's familiar with that? Why does China quit buying our garbage? Well, if you got is there any Chinese students here? <laughs> let's, let's hear it. Let's hear it. That's exactly right. <laughs> One more. Yeah, see, the, the industry matured, China society matured where they would be. They didn't need to buy yeah. stuff. Where do you think our scrap went for a few years? Feel. Mm -hmm. Open seat. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mean to give I'm talking about the next thing from our scrap. India. India. Yeah, India, Thailand, Malaysia. Yeah. 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 yeah, they're not. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, kind of an open, open question. So you said we recycle three times and then we cannot recycle plastic, whatever decay happens. So why that bother doing recycling and not just burn it off? Like, it sounds to be energy efficient. Eventually, it's easier to deal with CO2 emissions than to deal with microplastics everywhere. Like, yeah. as in an environmental sense, like uh, carbon monoxide and car carbon dioxide actually, are cyclical in nature. So why why are we bothering recycling seems that in the, we continue? Because it's cheaper to landfill and just to get a permit for they call them incinerators, but that's not what they are. If you don't like burning plastic, call it an incinerator, which makes 
It has chlorine in the plastic hydrocarbons with chlorine when you burn, make what? People uh, from East Palestine know about this. Mm -hmm. It makes HF, GAT, or HCl. It also makes dioxins. So you require a lot of environmental controls when you burn garbage that are not necessary for burning coal and natural gas. So that's a little bit more. The back east, the landfill is expensive. Burning is the preferred way. And companies like Govanda, they recently changed their name, but you can look them up. They have like 80 power plants of about 50 to 80 megawatts each. They were burning up to 2,000 each, burning 2,000 tons a day of garbage. It's a great way to get better things. Landfilling is stupid, burning is much better in my view. Because when you burn it, you get all of the metal and other things back that can be recovered there. Um, yes, Lee. So, but for this information, in the plant for mining, it can cost 250 million. What about the medium size uh, recycling plant? How much it costs? Uh, you know, Help me out this the exact question again, please. Okay, so what is the cost of a medium sized recycling plant? Okay, you can generally figure the engineering construction procurement of all the equipment getting a plant ready of a large size, like my client is building a 40 ton per hour plant, which is the largest plant in the world. See, most of those have five tons an hour. You might be typically spending somewhere between $100 and $400 per ton per hour annual capacity. What is that number? Mm -hmm. What's the capital cost? Eric's going to calculate. He's going to tell us. So if we had 40 tons an hour, it's a thousand hours a year. And this cost it out of $200 per ton per hour per annum. We're talking about somewhere around. $500 million. $400 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 that can be polymerized in the polyam, but yes. But to say from uh, hearing this talk, um, the future recycling, or rather the current state of recycling, it looks rather grim. Um, is there actually a positive? Is there something where this is something that needs to be improved, or is it like, no, this is kind of what we're at, and we'll get marginal improvements, so that's it? They've been marginally improved. You look at like Republic. Waste handling in Dallas, Texas. They have a state of the art plant there. The their big pay item is newspapers, cardboard. Cardboard's worth a lot of money. Because that goes what we call pulpers. Those are guys that just mix it with water. chemicals and water and they form paste and they re, re roll that back to the paper. The real secret the long term life of plastic should go back to the monomer. And replace crude oil from which it came. Mechanical recycling is a dead end. What we really need to do is twofold design packages that aren't like the things you get from Costco. You get a little battery in this thing that is used to prevent theft, which you can't hide under my jacket. That requires a cutting torch <laughs> and a cherry picker to tear up. Who's ever tried to get a hold of a package you almost give up, but you think, I'm not going to give up, I'd be embarrassed. Mm -hmm. So you just get a bigger set of shears, mm -hmm. or hopefully a box knife where you don't cut your femoral artery. <laughs> okay, that type of packaging has got to go. We're actually going to get more back into wood products. You know, back in the days when you had paper, we're not, we're not trying to prevent the kids from stealing Things off the shelf. Probably <laughs> packaging is expensive. We need to cut down on the, the use of plastics for packaging. It's invaluable, let's say, in the medical industry because it can be sanitary, 
we can pass gamma rays or x rays to go to sterilize the product without damaging the package itself. There's a role for plastic that only plastic can help. <coughs> so we reduce that. We also make it recyclable. We don't put all these colors with it. Okay, all of our bottles will be slightly blue color, you know, drink bottles. We don't have that one clear. It's a matter of society acceptance. And if we cut down the number of colors and the purity and all that, sorting becomes easier. Instead of landfill, we burn and make energy. Yes, so there's, there's all this design for disassembly we've been talking about for 30 years so mm -hmm. that you don't have six different types of resins in a in a computer um, case mm -hmm. and or in an automobile dashboard. And the other one of the other big things is the logistics of collection. Um, you've got trucks running around neighborhoods um, and you've got two people in that truck and they're 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 they pick the single streams better, but it it's still, you know, you've got to buy the tires. You start calculating the cost of tires and the cost of labor and uh, cool. and, and all of then and then fuel and getting it to us to a place so the the logistics of the recycling somehow or another has to be improved because even that by itself can kill the economics of recycling yeah no easy answers you have a question so to improve plastic recycling what do you think is the one thing that we need to change that it can maximize recycling is it like Making all the bottles blue so it's easier to sort. Is it, oh, is it or not making plastic or how would you like one? What factor do you manipulate that will bring like recycling, make more efficient? Or, well, where there's bottle, I hate to say this, if you make it where it's costly to throw something away, you get a deposit on the bottle that works. Stays with bottle. What they call bottle law, Maine, California. Click on the bottle. It should say every bottle should say what it's worth in different states. We've already put a 10 cent uh, count on bags. That's what it costs you. It's not what you get if you find a bag. But if you make the words up and on for people to do something, drive them with money. Now, states with bottle bills. Finding pet bottles in the trash is almost non existent. They're like 95% bottle free because all the bottles are, you've seen the dumpster divers, right? Why are they doing that? They're on them cans because they can actually make some marginal money. And instead of throwing something in the trash, you'd rather get that nickel back for that bottle. Economics, that's what can be done right away. Ultimately, and this is sort of like I end the thought with this, it requires people who can get the job done. When you, and this is a, just a personal opinion, when you look at the people that are currently in the scrap business, it is very opaque, it's not out and open. We don't have the same technology transfers that you find in finding the metallurgy and geology. We don't have central databases that are really Pretty true. We have deception, opaqueness, subterfuge in the industry. So as a result, we don't really know what the payback's going to be. If you're a bank, would you loan my client five hundred million dollars if you don't know the value of what this plastic's going to be? No, not unless you're a Silicon Valley bank. <laughs> <laughs> However, this. I know exactly what the value of the product is. Can you guess? And they make things like ethylene and petrochemicals, which are traded on the commodity market. Ethylene that comes from recycling pet bottles is no different than ethylene that comes from crude oil. So they know exactly what that's worth. The only question is what's the yield of ethylene per ton of plastic? Okay. It's no different than what you're doing in the smelter. You're selling 
array or you're selling copper ingots or something, those have value that's widely understood on the commodity work. As a metallurgist, you want to have 99 point whatever, 99.99999% something like that. Mm -hmm. 100%. But no, that's what the geologist is. In your dream. <laughs> what we need is, like I said, why did the client hire mining engineers to do some pretty tough thinking about their plant? We know material handling, we haven't been contaminated about five, ten an hour stuff. We made out of sheet metal and duct tape. That's the way we used to do stuff, but nothing anymore. So a lot of mining equipment is now going to be over the next. 10 years is going to be replied and recycled. No more questions. I think I've gone past my question. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.